statistics before, one in five or 20% of the population. So if we look at that number, out of those, it's about 20 to 30% happens within institutions, synagogues, schools, and other places, sporting clubs, and the rest of it, 70 or 80%, happens within the family environment, whether it's a parent or an uncle or a grandparent, a neighbor, a tutor, someone who comes to teach a child. So in most of these cases, the child knows the abuser. And the abuser doesn't just start abusing. There is something that now we know, to, we call it the brooming process. And this is a process that the pedophile who wants to groom that child for sex later on. So they start with seeing what it is they can provide that child that will gain their trust and gain their love. So in my case, for example, I'm one of 17 children, so it was things like attention, time, um, sometimes purchasing things for us, gifts. Yes. In, in one of the cases, it was at the age of 11 or 12, one of them, the first abuser, Dr. Sorbansky, let me drive his car. So sometimes, so it makes you think about when they actually go and abuse. Firstly, maybe I can put up with this abuse because I'm getting so many other wonderful treats along the way. So I'll ignore Thinking that. Something to you, right? Yes, and in other times you also think, maybe, I'm, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I did something to cause him to do this to me. And especially when there is two perpetrators, one after the other, you think, maybe I'm doing something that's wrong here. So there are a number of these types of thoughts that goes into a, a child's mind, uh, especially a child within a, an ultra-orthodox environment where we had absolutely no sex education. We didn't talk about the word sex. Um, so we didn't know what it actually meant. So I didn't even have the language to express what was happening to me. And did you have any support after what happened to you? Like, uh, when did you decide yeah. to talk about it? So after the first abuse, I shared it, um, some of it slowly with a friend of mine, my closest friend at the time, who was my age. And he betrayed me and went to share it with other classmates. And what happened was, in the next months and then years, I was then bullied at school. Um, I was called that I was gay because older men were having sex with me. It was abuse. It wasn't sex, but that's what it was. Yeah, I think that, uh, sorry, I think that this is, uh, you have to make clear, it's not sex, it's that, abuse. Exactly right. And I think that's very important because often I know in the media it's very frustrating, especially to victims where we see, you know, a, a teacher has sexual relations with a student. No, he didn't. He that raped or abused that, that student. Um, so I shared it with him and, and, and I was betrayed. And it was, it was so difficult to experience the abuse during that time, but then to go to the school grounds. And I was in school as a religious boy from often from seven to eight, seven in the morning until 10 at night. And to be in that kind of environment and people would look at me and know uh, what I had endured and tease me about it in front of teachers and the rabbis were aware of it uh, as well and kept quiet about it and that was very very difficult for me and as a result when the second abuser came I kept my mouth shut I didn't tell anyone at the time but it, as it turns out people knew because they just knew uh, apparently he had been abusing other people as well. So the leadership there was aware of what was going on. Now, I just tried to ignore it. Uh, obviously, I reacted to the abuse in a way that at the time I didn't realize that I was reacting to the abuse. I thought I was just being a naughty teenager. Uh, I became completely disinterested in religion. Uh, started. I forced myself to stop keeping Shabbat, the Sabbath. I remember to... Uh, forced myself to switch the light on or off on Shabbat just because I was so angry at the religion and, and the people who were claiming to be representing my religion. And I remember forcing myself to eat not kosher food. You know, to eat a not kosher piece of meat is, when you grow up in Chabad in a religious environment, it's not just not kosher, it's disgusting. It's called treif. It's So I remember forcing myself to eat a not kosher piece of schnitzel just, and I had to do it because I just wanted to escape from it. And of course there were other things such as um, substance abuse, uh, not doing well in school, and of course it was around my bar mitzvah. I, I, from 
really looking forward to my bar mitzvah and to do all the religious services that I was looking forward to do, I became completely disinterested. And I didn't study for my bar mitzvah. We did a really a very basic thing. My parents did a nice party, but I didn't do any of the really religious things. So it affected uh, all of us in a, in a significant way. It affected also the family, my behavior. As the oldest boy in such a large family, I had five boys immediately under me. And my parents obviously were struggling to deal with you know, an older boy who is meant to be an example to his siblings. How do you deal with that? So it was very difficult. I used to be thrown out of school often uh, because of the trouble. And I was doing religious studies only from the age of about 12 until 18. And when I was 18, I decided to make Aliyah, went to Israel, I served in the army. And when I was 20 years old, I went back just for one month in the middle of the army for a holiday for my sister's wedding in Melbourne. And I heard on the radio that uh, the police are doing an, um, a campaign. If anyone has any information about child sexual abuse, we encourage you to go to the police. I was in my parents' house. It was the first time I thought it happened to me. I need to go to the police. I, obviously I have to do something. I have to do something. I've been thinking about it for a very long time, but I pushed it out. I suppressed it. And straight away when I heard it, instinctively, I went downstairs to my father's office in the house and I told him what happened. Um, he was shocked. And of course. He just asked them again the names and, and I told him everything. And I said, can you please call the police? And he called the, the police. They were there either that day or the next day. They took statements. Uh, I went to the head rabbi there. He knew about it all. I didn't have to tell him anything. Uh, he was aware exactly, and he said to me, uh, we're dealing with it. There is no need for you to do anything else. The problem was that my first abuser was already in New York, so he wasn't in Australia anymore. My second abuser was still being employed by the school, despite what they knew. He was still in charge working, of school. Working with children, right? Or just working with children, but he was responsible for the safety and well-being of children. He had access to every room. It was, it was a shock to me that this was going on for many years after. The police were unable to do anything because it was lack of evidence, because it was my word against my perpetrator's words. So they didn't close the file, they left it for to deal with later on. And in that time, I was very upset. I went back to Israel to serve in the army. I thought, finally, I mustered the courage to go to the police, to talk to the rabbi, and then they, it was a slap in the face. They, no one wanted to do anything or could do anything. Um, I went back to Australia after a few years to start my life again. And um, I started to integrate back into the community, not religious, but just in the broader Jewish community. And I started, I got my degree in university, international relations, and I started working in the Jewish community in combating anti-Semitism and in pro-Israel advocacy. I was the head of the Anti-Defamation Commission in Australia. And that's when I started learning of the value of media. I thought, I went to the police, I went to the rabbis, nothing was happening. The, my abusers are still free to harm other people. There is no justice, maybe I should start. The problem was, uh, it was such a taboo topic. So many stigmas. Until today. Till today. Less, but still a big issue. So we decided uh, as a family not to uh, say anything about it until uh, 2011, I was, I became the vice president of the Jewish community in Australia. So I had a senior leadership position and there were a few other circumstances and I felt if I'm a genuine leader, I need to take a leadership role on this issue because if I don't do it, no one else is going to do it. Um, and that, that's what I did. And it was front page news in Australia. And as a result of that, many other victims from the Jewish community and even outside the Jewish community went to the police, shared their story. And that's why, in fact, my second abuser is now sitting in jail because there were 15 people approximately who went to the police and said he abused them also. Then there was a court case. And now he's sitting in jail. Um, and quite a few other um, uh, perpetrators within the Jewish community were also convicted. Initially, there was support from the Jewish community. Soon after, it changed. There was, okay, we spoke about it, that's it. We don't need to talk about it anymore. Let's shove it under the carpet. And that's when the attacks against me, against my family, against other victims and their families became very public. 
not just by the religious leadership, it was also by the mainstream leadership, um, not the, the, the Jewish community leadership, my colleagues, my former colleagues, standing up against me. It was very hurtful. I mean, as someone who not only experienced child sexual abuse and the trauma and the cover-ups, suddenly, I, all I did was try to pursue justice for myself and others and try to make the community safer. And suddenly, I'm being attacked from every position. Um, so it was, it was a, a big struggle, but ultimately, um, I persevered with the support initially of very few people, and slowly the support grew. And now you have an organization, right? That's right. In, in, so when I was in Australia, we established an organization. I established SEDEC to deal with issues in Australia, to support victims so they know where they can go, um, and also to raise awareness and to educate the community. And that got increasingly more and more support um, in the last couple of years. You know, I went to uh, Israel, uh, and the main reason I left to Israel, and in fact my parents also left Australia, um, and my dad's Australian and grew up his whole life there, but the reasons we left Australia wasn't by choice. It, we, we, we essentially felt uh, we had to leave. My parents were still in Chabad. They were excommunicated from their community, um, and, and it was also very difficult in our family, so we just decided to move to Israel, and we did that. And there I established uh, an organization called the Oz, which is in Hebrew, call his voice, and Oz is uh, courage and strength, which is very fitting for this issue because it's something that's been um, very, we've been very silent about it, and it does take a lot of courage to talk about this issue in any setting for anyone. Um, as we spoke about before, the uh, taboo to nature of it and the stigma is attached. Because um, it's like a subject really, really uh, serious, and normally people don't want to talk about it. Right. Exactly. And, and there's a whole lot of reasons for it. I mean, we spoke about the statistics before. Many of the people experienced it themselves or know others who experienced it. So for them, in some cases, they just don't want to hear about it. They don't want to know. It's better, safer for them from their perspective to shut it out. And as we now know, it's not quite the case because if we shut it out, it affects our lives in different ways. And we can maybe talk briefly about the impact in a moment. But the organization called Bells, what we do is we deal with the issue to prevent child sexual abuse in the global Jewish community. It's about uh, raising awareness, as we're doing today. It's about educating the public. It's uh, empowering victims and uh, providing them with a voice. Um, it's changing legislation, working with government. I work with the Israeli Knesset to change laws, especially Israel as uh, basically the, the, Jew, the, the homeland of the Jewish people where you have many Jews from around the world, diaspora, going to Israel. That means there are many victims going to Israel um, who need support. And more concerningly, in some ways, there are many pedophiles from Jewish communities around the world who go to Israel. Sometimes they were caught in their countries and they just need to escape. And the law of return means that they can just go to Israel, get a citizen, get citizenship, and it's okay, and they're safe. So, those are the types of issues that we need to talk about. And also the Jewish community, we're, 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 we are a Jewish community, a global Jewish community, and there are people who go not just to Israel, but from one community to the next. And often we see that also in the religious community where they go to teach in one yeshiva and then go to the other yeshiva in another country, and often people don't hear about it. And that's why it's important that we are all open and talking about these issues. And how adults, and when I say adults, like parents, teachers, and also leaders, um, how they can talk about it with the kids? Because like they are the, the victims, right? Yes, so one of the things that we do is actually, uh, and I personally do this, I go around the world and I speak to organizations and the leaders of organizations, schools, the boards, and the, the principals, um, um, camps, and, and all of those, and talk to them as a group about how best to, to, to address this issue. And of course, there's three groups who I would say. There's the staff and volunteers, there's the parents, and then there's the children. And the way we approach it is to focus on the prevention firstly, which how do we prevent it to the best ability of our ability? How do we intervene? So intervention, when we suspect something is going on, what do we do? And lastly, about victim support. Once we've identified and we've intervened, what do we have to do for the victims and for the families who are also secondary victims? Um, and it's, it's very complex and complicated. It doesn't, it's not something that we can discuss really in a minute because these, these are you know, courses or workshops that we do over uh, long periods, but 
probably, if I would say, the uh, message, the most important message, uh, in terms of prevention and intervention and support, covers all of them, is really about discussing this issue. It's about talking. Because perpetrators know that there is a code of silence around this issue. Not just in the religious community, no, everywhere. everywhere. There is a code of silence, we're uncomfortable to talk about this issue. So once we talk about it, in an age appropriate, in a culturally sensitive way, that will change the whole dynamic. Because a child will know that my parents and my school teachers have raised this issue with me, and someone is making me feel uncomfortable. Whether it's an adult, or sometimes it's an older child, very often, as a subgroup, you have older children sexually abusing younger children. It may not be necessarily pedoph pedophilic behavior. Sometimes it would be, but in many cases, it would simply be uh, a child trying to check their sexuality and, and, and you know, investigate and, and, and try to have a better understanding of who they are. Um, it doesn't make it right, but it just changes the, 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 the approach in terms of how we deal with such an issue. Uh, but it is, um, uh, there are different angles in how we should need to approach it and how we respond to it and address it. Um, and I, I spoke briefly about the issue of the impact and what it does. I think that's something that really needs, people need to understand. And unfortunately from personal experience as a victim, someone who endured this and as someone who deals with hundreds of victims through over the past few years, the impact is profound and often it's also um, lifelong. Um, at least it's a long-term thing. And I mean, personally, I never went to seek therapy uh, up until the last two years because, again, growing up in a religious environment, it wasn't encouraged to go to therapy. So it, I would always encourage those who have been abused to go to seek therapy. But it's not just that. The, uh, if we think about the, um, some of the impact, substance abuse, uh, relationship issues, holding down jobs, um, eating disorders, suicide, suicide ideation, self-harm, etc. The oh, list goes on. And it doesn't mean that everyone who was sexually abused experiences those types of uh, symptoms and, and, and uh, consequences. It's Every person is different. It may depend on who we are as individuals, our resilience. It depends who our abuser was. It depends on what happened when we disclose the information to someone. Did they believe us? Did they support us? So every case is an individual case, and we can't generalize. And child sexual abuse is crime. So how the community can work with the, the police? Like how they can do something together? Yes, I think mean, firstly I wanted to say that in my trip here in South America, which is my first time here um, in Brazil, certainly Sao Paulo, we've had a few meetings um, over the last uh, couple of days. And I must say overall, I've been very impressed with um, many individuals, leaders, um, religious and, and rabbis and, and mainstream leaders uh, who are willing to engage and discuss this topic. Uh, at the same time, there have also been those who are aware, uh, based on the allegations that I've received from a number of people over the last few years, that not only, of course, that there was abuse going on in these communities, just as there is in every community, but some rabbis and some other leaders have not been responding in an inappropriate manner in terms of providing support to victims and their families. We're not expecting uh, leaders, whether they're rabbis or, or, or mainstream leaders of organizations, to decide uh, who's right, who's wrong, who's guilty, who's innocent. Uh, that's for the police to investigate. It's for the uh, authorities to, to, to investigate and also to, to take it to court if there, there's a need and to pursue justice in that way. What we expect of our leadership, and that comes back to your question, is to stand there for, in support of victims and their families. It's to raise awareness about this issue, to ensure that the community organizations, who in some cases are under, are under the leadership, have appropriate mechanisms in place, uh, policies and procedures. Every organization that is responsible for children must have policies and procedures, what is okay to do with children, what is not okay. And I'm not talking about whether it's okay to abuse a child or not, of course not, but just some basic uh, uh, rules and regulations about what you can and can't do to be in a room with a child, or for parents to send their children to a mikvah, to a ritual bath, all by themselves, 
just some very basic. So it is our responsibility as adults, as leaders, as parents, as teachers, to ensure that we know what we need to do to ensure we have a safer community. And we can't ignore this issue anymore because it is happening here, there is no doubt about it anymore, and we need to raise this issue. And I can tell you, every time, uh, one of the reasons I'm here in South America, I've traveled the world and I continue to do that. And I've been to most continents where there is a significant Jewish community, and the issue has surfaced in all of those communities. Often after I go and speak, people come out and they say, I was sexually abused, and they go to the rabbi, they go to the leader, and they go to the therapist, and it becomes a bit of a topic, and the local media starts to cover it, and there is a conversation that goes on. South America is the only continent that I have not seen this issue being discussed at any level. And I'm going around to talk to, to some of these leaders over the last few days and in the future, and they've all said to me, we've never discussed it here. Some of them have, have heard of these issues that they happen, of course, not in their institution, but it happens, but that's it. So part of my role here is really to try to raise the awareness so that the community can take this issue seriously and start to think about it because there are many people who are watching this program and have experienced abuse or know people who were sexually abused and in some cases there are people who have actually perpetrated these crimes. And it's time now that we as a community take this issue seriously where we have an allegation of sexual abuse. There is only one thing we need to do. Go to the authorities. You go to the police, you make a statement, and let them decide what they needs to be done about it. And families of those who were abused and the community at large needs to provide support, needs to provide guidance, needs to ensure that perpetrators are aware that this is not going to continue to happen any longer. And I think that is something that is important to, important to say is that you're not here to say something against the yeshiva or the orthodox community. It's like to talk about the subject. Right. Absolutely. As, as we, we started off this conversation, yes. it happens in every segment of the community, whether it's the Jewish community or outside the community, it doesn't matter. Um, what I have seen is that when we talk about it, there is greater awareness and children become less vulnerable because of that. And I am completely supportive of uh, the rabbi's role in addressing this issue because it is important. The rabbis have unique responsibility here, which is really to, because, because they are seen as, as the respected leaders in our community, especially within the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox community, and the Yeshivot, um, and all they need to do is what the rest of us are doing is, when allegations come to them, as they come to anyone else, support the victims of the family and say, it's okay to go to the police. Uh, over the years, we have seen some segments of the community, and I'm not saying just in South America, I'm saying beyond that uh, there are issues about going to the police. We cannot go and tell about another Jewish person to the secular authorities, for example. It's often called the Sira. Well, rabbis from around the world have come out publicly to say that the Sira does not apply in the context of child sexual abuse, that everyone needs to go to the police when these cases happen. So it's not just me saying it and other activists, it is also the leaders and the rabbinic leaders, the uh, rabbis, who are, some of them I work with closely and are very supportive of my work and I support them as well. And they say, we all must go to the police. There should be no discussion about it. If we're not sure about, did it really happen, did it not, let the police work that out and decide. So and there is some campaigns like no to you that educates and alerts. So how this kind of campaign can denounce the abuses and help also? Yes. Any campaign that is run in a legitimate way, an appropriate way, is extremely helpful because what it does is it raises awareness in the community. It also normalizes the language. It's okay to talk about sexual abuse. I remember in 2011 when I started talking about my personal case, my story, it was so difficult when I said, I am a victim of child sexual abuse. I was abused. Every time I said it, it was so difficult. And when people around me heard it, I could see, I could feel their discomfort. But now, quite a few years later, 
the situation is very different in other parts of the world, obviously not in South America, where the conversation is still a little bit behind, which hopefully we're starting the conversation. Yeah, we're all as a group starting, you are helping, so there's, it always takes a number of people to start. Um, but it, it, these campaigns are critical, and that's why I think the Jewish community leadership should support these types of campaigns. And they need to be done in a very sensitive manner to respect um, cultural sensitivities, uh, religious sensitivities, age appropriateness, but there are ways to do it, and I completely commend this campaign um, and, and other campaigns like it to get the word out there, because the more we talk about it, the safer our children will be today, and also those who were sexually abused in the past these types of campaigns and all the work that we do now around this issue will help in their healing process as well. And if someone wants to talk to you and to know more about your organization, do you have a website or an Absolutely, AU? yes, they can get onto our website, uh, kolvoz.org, K-O-L-V-O-Z.org. Um, we're also on uh, social media as uh, what we need to be doing now. Every, everyone works on social media. So absolutely, they can get in touch with us and we will do whatever we can to support and assist. Thank you very much. And also to share your story with us. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much Thank you. O abuso sexual e a exploração de crianças e adolescentes de novo. Deixa só nela, vá agora. Tá bom, vou fazer thank you very much e vira, tá bom? Yes. So, thank you very much to share your story with us. Thank, thank you so you. much, Priscilla. Thank you. O abuso sexual e a exploração de crianças e adolescentes é crime. Denuncie, diz que sim. Ok. Foi? Okay.